You are listening to the Birth Bruja podcast, radical, transformative, empowering birth work in all its nuances. Reproductive justice, racial justice, reclaiming ancestral wisdom, decolonizing the birth space. Here, my friends, we go deep. Join us each month as we chat with activists, scholars, healers, community wellness workers, birthing folk, and beyond to explore topics from their roots to their leaves. I'm a woman. I'm a grandmother. I'm a daughter. I have a son. I'm not an angel. I'm not the devil. I came to jail when I was so young. You are listening to episode nine, Birthing Behind Bars. We are joined by Ishel Chavez and Rebecca Orozco from the Roots of Labor Birth Collective. This is part two of a three-part series where we dive into the badass organization that is the Bay Area-based RLBC, AKA Roots of Labor Birth Collective. These doulas of color provide full price, sliding scale, and volunteer doula services. They partner with Santa Rita Jail and Bay Area clinics to serve low income and communities of color. In this episode, we dive into their work within Santa Rita Jail. Santa Rita is the third largest jail in California and the fifth largest in the country. It houses women who are serving time for minor offenses and probation violation, as well as folks passing through as pre-trial detainees, as in people who haven't been convicted of any crime yet. Currently, there are at least two lawsuits that have been filed against Santa Rita Jail. All of this information has been taken from local news publications. I encourage you listeners to Google and check it out. First lawsuit I came across was on behalf of Candace Steele, who was forced to give birth alone in a dirty concrete cell with no blankets or towels. She was eight months pregnant and had complained of pain and contractions earlier in the day. When taken to the hospital, she was diagnosed with Braxton Hicks, aka false contractions, and sent back. After hours of screaming for help in solitary confinement, guards finally came rushing in when they heard the sounds of a baby cry. The next lawsuit came across is more recent, and it's by nine women, six of whom were pregnant at the time of incarceration. They claim they were pressured to have abortions, denied proper nutrition and prenatal care, forced to endure repeated incidences of vaginal bacterial infections due to poor laundering and unclean underwear, made to live in unsanitary conditions, and more. Under such scrutiny, you can imagine that Santa Rita Jail is particularly sensitive about their PR. RLBC has worked hard to jump through all the security clearances and hoops of bureaucracy required to gain access into the jail and their associated spaces. As such, we did our best to speak truthfully while avoiding areas that might result in backlash that could impact their ability to do this work all the while trying to stay within their confidentiality agreements. Dear listeners, security culture is very real and very palatable in every experience of supporting non-free folk. It was interesting to feel it within my own body as we sat together here in the recording studio. With all that being said, please join me in taking a big breath and getting grounded for what many will find to be an intense conversation. Please feel free to pause at any time, walk away, come back when you're ready. Let's dive in. May you always be there. One is not enough. Every day is barely sufficient. Through you, prayers are answered. The world exists from the breath God gave you to push onward with a mighty spirit and flawless dignity mellow words lift all burdens from others onto your shoulders love has no end in every situation a single touch heals every wound rubies are nothing next to you your value surpasses them all with the blessings of your presence by Anonymous Santa Rita Jail Inmate, a Mother's Day poem. 
Welcome, Rebecca and Ishel, to the Birth Bruja podcast. It is an honor to have you both here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Let's begin by going around and introducing yourselves. Um, Rebecca, would you mind beginning? Sure. Where are your people from and what are you doing these days? Yeah, my people are from the Estado de México. My dad's side, Chilangos, from the city, many generations. And my mom's side from uh, San Jose El Vidrio, just outside of Mexico City. And east of L.A. raised me, San Gabriel Valley, Tongva land. And yeah, and now I'm here since 2011. Uh, what I'm doing now, I am a full-spectrum doula, do mostly birth, postpartum, and ongoing family doula care. And been visioning with Roots of Labor Birth Collective since 2016. And yeah, core root member helping carry out the week to week admin stuff and currently balancing work, life, and spirit work. Mm. <laughs> Andy Shiv, where are your people from and what are you doing these days? So, my people are from Guatemala and I am. Um, doing a lot of postpartum work and also uh, continuing to work with the collective. I work mostly with migrant mamas. Thank you, Michelle. To start us off, when did RLBC begin working with incarcerated folk? So Roots of Labor Birth Collective has been working with incarcerated people since its origins. Um, back in 2014, starting with the East Bay Community Birth Support Project, which was a training for women of color doulas. And part of us were um, either previously incarcerated women or trans or queer. Um, and we, it was a free training provided to members of the community to go out and serve members of the community. Mm. And the training was actually by also members of the community. So it was it was a very it was very special in that way. And that was Birth Justice Project, Black Women Birthing Justice, who came together to create that training for us. And both me and Elena have been a part of that since the beginning. And uh, after that training took place, uh, we realized the importance of having a collective that would support each other and would continue this work, but also be su sustainable. So when we got refunded to continue doing this work, Instead of doing another doula training, we decided to create this collective to sustain ourselves so that we can continue to serve the community and also continue to work at the jail. And Rebecca, what services do you continue to provide today within Santa Rita Jail? Every Monday, we've got at least one to two Roots of Labor doulas visiting Santa Rita Jail. We're there for a couple of hours meeting with pregnant folks. We offer prenatal support and information, always introducing ourselves as a independent organization not affiliated with the jail. And we connect folks to RLBC doulas upon release and for folks who are anticipating a, serving a longer sentencing time, we attend their births, which is amazing. Otherwise, they would have nobody other than a deputy in the room. And we're also right now in the process of working towards being able to offer abortion support for folks inside who elect to terminate pregnancies. For many of our listeners, this is the first time they're hearing about birth work behind bars. What are some of the differences in supporting free folk versus non-free folk? That's a big question because even starting with like looking at just free people, already no one free person looks the same. Mm -hmm. So we're still looking at navigating class, race, gender politics, and so age politics to ability politics and different body sizes. So already that in itself is, um, you know, as a birth worker, a lot to navigate. So putting that aside and then you go to serving people who are incarcerated, it's all of that. Plus, they have most of their civil liberties taken away from them. Mm. So it's actually very limiting in the kind of support that you're able to get. You know, you can't really bring medicines in to share. There, You can't suggest different nutrition or prenatal options. You can't say make sure you're getting good sleep or physical activity because these folks are they're on a, a regimented diet that, truth be told, is 
shit. <laughs> Una mierda, perdón. And, <laughs> um, and, you know, they have a hard time sleeping in the spaces that they're at. We work with all level and classes of security people. So in the medium barracks, it's um, kind of, I don't know what to call that, like dorm style, military style. There's mm-hmm. a lot of bunk beds. Um, and I don't even know how many people are in there. And so... With all the new people coming in, the the security and roll call checks at 3 o'clock in the morning or 3 p.m., it's not exactly, like, really good sleep. or in, And you're on a horrible mattress on top of it. So it's hard to give, like, sleep well, eat well, which feels, like, so standard to a regular doula practice on the outside. That's just for starters. But usually when we're meeting these people... They're not even thinking about their pregnancy. They're just like some people are finding out they're pregnant upon coming in. So they're navigating whatever got them there and to begin with in the first place. And then they're finding out the pregnancy. Um, it's a range of folks coming in too, whether they were on probation, whether they were undocumented. And so sometimes, to be honest, when we're introducing people ourselves to people the first time, the support we offer sounds kind of like irrelevant Mm. and so sometimes it's just like yeah you're here it's shitty and you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do next right and so sometimes it's just like catching that at the beginning and being like well good luck with this we hope your next court appointment goes well and just know that we're here every single monday and so even like just being able to plant that seed and um we'll be here again and so i mean we just we just told you like kind of on paper all the things we go in and do every Monday, but um, sometimes that's hard to like get across at the first time meeting somebody. Yeah, I could imagine. There's a, a lot of dynamics that the pregnant folk are already having to deal with. So I could only imagine. You said you guys are there for two hours. So are these little mini appointments with each person, or is it like a big circle, or how does that work? So usually we have one-on-ones. We feel like a lot of times that's more effective. Sometimes there's people who don't feel confident speaking in a circle, you know, or that we can get more done speaking on a one-on-one. But sometimes we don't have the capacity to listen to everybody. So, and sometimes we do group circles. And that also can be very helpful as well because we realize that they can help each other with resources and they hear each other's stories A lot of times they themselves are the ones that are responding to questions and answers. And so it just creates a really good, healthy group dynamic. I love when they do group circles because, honestly, you're talking about what it looks like, I think, a little bit in your question. Yeah. And, you know, first thing, one of the things we do is we check our privilege and we literally leave our government identification. So also giving away our freedom when we walk into the door. But that said, I have personally never been incarcerated even though it has affected folks in my family. So then being able to hear them share their experiences, they are way more on the same plane and have sometimes more resources to offer than I sometimes I feel like we have coming mm. from where we're at. What we're doing with our security clearance is being able to like come in and block out this time so that they can even have that together, where even though they're in the same, maybe the same role, they're in separate pods and otherwise might not be able to always get to talk to each other. Rebecca, can you tell us more about the actual birth experience? What perhaps the difference is between supporting free folk and non-free folk, you know, in early labor through? Yeah, definitely. It's not like your standard on-call doula. You're having this clear communication via text, maybe email, maybe a phone call. For the roots of labor people supporting clients who are on-call, we have about, at present, 10 SRJ, SRJ is Santa Rita Jail, volunteers right now. And so we share a, a WhatsApp. Mm-hmm. We're on a WhatsApp group. So we're collectively on call. Yeah. So that kind of breaks it down. No, like one person is having to take this on. And so the OBGYN at Santa Rita Jail, once person starts to show signs of labor, bookmark if they actually take someone saying they're in early labor as being a real thing Mm. um but yeah so once they that call is finally made they're transferred to an alameda county hospital that we also have security clearance so it's this trifecta of clearance that uh, roots of labor has been able to get with that hospital and with the jail and with our doulas 
They know which doulas are approved to go in. And so once we get the call, our Santa Rita or volunteer coordinator, shout out to Brianna Wilborn, sends the alarm out to the WhatsApp group. And then it's like we start like, okay, I can do these hours. I can do these hours. And like generally we kind of block out a chunk of time. So no one's there too long. No one's missing paid work because Mm. RLBC presence at SRJ is volunteer ran. And um, yeah, we show up. And then when you're there, what what is the process like actually entering the birth room? So first you have to register at the front desk and say that you're coming in, uh, Sadula. And then usually you have to, um, there's two deputies um, that you have to talk to and explain what you're doing there as a doula. And they're in the room the entire time? Well, um, in my experience, um, they were outside the room doing the labor itself. But during the postpartum, they were inside the room. Got so you. after her, the she delivered, they were inside the room. But during the actual labor, they were outside. So um, I, I think it depends. So you check in with them, and um, then you you do basically what you would normally do as a doula. Um, you may be a little bit more limited depending on what the rules and regulations are at that time. Um, Are all the pain medications available, such as fentanyl or epidural? Yes, all the pain medications are available, but the skin-to-skin may not be. Really? Hmm. So I I see you struggling a little bit, Ishel, because so as Ari kindly mentioned in the intro, we have to be careful with what we say and... I think it's okay to say that there was a difficult birth of traumatic for the doulas that attended it, for the person that we served back in the fall, and they got a lot of backlash. So that was Ishelle's last birth back in the fall, and then I attended a birth, um, another SRJ birth in the spring, and we were all a little like, how is this going to happen this time? Things went as well as they could. I mean, there was not shackles. They gave us full reign as far as like support. And so you're doing all the things that you would do with the blah right there and looking at you. And so like I'm touching you, but they're not we're not allowed to touch them when we're inside. So this is like the first time that they're having physical contact and touch. Um, so I'm touching you and loving you and taking care of you, but also with the law looking and they get really uncomfortable. So the jail is such a controlled environment as far as what inmates are allowed to have, like their schedule, they're coming in and out of door spaces, and then suddenly they're being moved to another environment where there's still the law and they still have like that jurisdiction, but they don't have the same control of the space. So they're making sure there's not needles there. They're taking away your wow. fucking plastic fork yeah. when you want to eat and you're only allowed to eat with a spoon. Um, so they're they're like giving you the space, but you can also kind of I see. I feel like so much of it's the same, but the nuances are just really yeah. intense and powerful. And um, so, you know, they're not exactly liking it and you're trying to normalize it still Mm. for your birthing person but now you're also trying to normalize it for like this law enforcement that you don't necessarily agree with the whole system's existence but they've now been added to the birth team yeah they're your team too now yeah and you have to navigate that i just got this really powerful image of you know when we think about the birth team a lot of times Free folk consider their OB or their, because like, you know, most folks out here, hospital is the cheapest way to birth a baby, right? So a lot of times when people are thinking about the birth team, they think about the OB or their midwife as like, they're on my side, right? Meanwhile, in this situation, whoever the medical provider is, isn't their choice, isn't the birthing person's choice at all. Mm-hmm. And then also literally, very tangibly, you have the the prison industrial complex within who's again, part of your quote-unquote birth team without your consent. And then to be the doula holding space for all this and to attempt to normalize and to make best out of the situation through all that to try to connect someone to their own power. I just am totally overwhelmed by how important your work is and how crucial it is for you to continue to be able to do 
this work and to support others in doing this work and how much I just deeply appreciate y'all continuing to show up, not just in that space, but for yourselves. So if you're down, I'm just kind of wondering how breastfeeding is navigated in in this realm. Sometimes um, in, in the situation that I was in, um, the woman was not allowed to breastfeed. She was unable to have any contact with her child or their newborn baby. Mm. And um, that can be very difficult for everybody. A lot of times uh, the justification for that is, you know, that especially depending on what they're in for, they're considered a... They do color classifications, which psychologically is a mind trip in yeah. of itself. But yeah, if they're high... They treat them different. Like a high risk of violence is what they're tagged for? It's- yeah. If it was like very violent crime, then the justification that was given to me was that um, they cannot risk the baby's life um, huh. being taken hostage. And so... Even though, I mean, we can't go too much in, so we got to be careful. Yeah, but sure. that said, <laughs> when they put those colors and classifications on people, yes, maybe whatever they did was by the law wrong. But they don't like they don't know your life. So in that situation, particularly, unfortunately, because in this society, uh, we tend to um, dehumanize criminals. And so once you become a criminal in the society, sort of your humanity kind of goes out the door. And knowing that already and, you know, working with um, the prison industrial complex and deputies, um, sometimes our focus kind of tries to shift it to the to the rights of the child or the baby. I'm like, okay, well, just because the parent is incarcerated doesn't necessarily mean that the the child should have to suffer and so sometimes we try to stress the importance of of you know for the child um, things like breastfeeding and skin to skin contact and so forth but um, at the end of the day it's 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 their discretion so we're that's one of the main things that we're very limited that we don't you know it, it's it's up to them so and all these decisions all the administrative pieces around this are all decided before birth or is it literally you're in the space and you're just kind of discovering in the moment what's allowed and what's not allowed yeah and you're in the space and wow. discovering it in the moment it's literally wow. to the discretion of the deputies that are on for that 8 to 12 hour shift oh Given that said, they have little powwows when they do their little shift changes. Again, mentioning Ishelle had what was a hard birth for our collective and our client in the fall. And we had another one in the spring following the lawsuits coming to media attention and backlash in a messy situation. And things went a lot better given that. And they gave us more more agency in the space. That said, too, I can't help but see that one was also an inmate of color and one was not they were both high class inmates um things went better I want to feel like that they're trying to make it better too but I can't we can't help but feel the type of way too about it yeah especially because going back to challenges of supporting free people versus non-free people where's the kid where's that baby going and so you know we're still holding our other client while they're dealing with all the bureaucracy or shenanigans that all of that can you so if you can talk tell us a little bit more about that so baby comes uh is baby then taken away for a period of time or does baby get to stay with the birthing folk for a certain period of time or is that what you're saying is dependent on the deputies at the birth It's dependent. And so, I mean, we're only speaking from two experiences here, but they're very stark contrast. And um, I wish we could have, like, talked with other folks, too, to get some maybe the more in between. But the shackles happen. I think that's fair to say. We know that happens in the state and in this country. So if if you do get to hold your baby, then you're holding your baby while being shackled. Um, there's usually a social worker in- involved. CPS um, is involved, um, and they make the decision of where where the child goes, if the baby goes. If the incarcerated folk has a supportive family member, 
who's wanting to either be of support at the birth experience if possible and or is willing and wanting to take baby. How is that weave into? Yeah, nobody's allowed to be in the birth room, um, not even the hospital. Nobody is um, notified uh, for security reasons. They do not notify anybody any family members or friends. And if there's a family member that wants to take custody, but they still have to go through CPS, CPS needs to make sure that they're reliable, they have a background check, financially can support this person, Mm -hmm. the baby, and so forth. I think they're making some folks do classes now, too, which sometimes adding other barriers for other people, too, more hoops. Mm -hmm. That's actually, so one thing I'm hearing is throughout all of these, there's a lot of moving pieces in play. And... I'm just thinking about how difficult birth is in general for folks outside with accesses to resources and and education, let alone for someone who's overburdened with restrictions. So what happens when there is a language barrier or an ability barrier? So uh, because I work with a lot of migrant people and um, and that's why when we founded this collective, I just want to go back I, I pushed very hard that um, that it was very important not only to have um, doulas or, or comadronas, I prefer that term, that looked like members of the community, but also that they speak different languages, speak a second language, third language, because I definitely could see the disparities in birth people who did not speak the language and the difference in care um, compared to people not. And that was just just generally speaking, just with free people. Um, with non-free folks, obviously that, that gets more complicated. So I think that um, even though hospitals are um, supposed to have these blue phones with interpreting equipment and legally they're supposed to do, the reality of that as doulas, for us who already do this work, we realize that that's not always the case. Uh, in theory, it is, but in practice, it's not. And a lot of these nurses are overworked. And so it's it's very important to have that, but um, to have somebody who speaks the language so that they can do translation, interpretation. And um, there was a particular incarcerated mama who I spent a lot of time with who did not speak English. And so that's something that's also very important about what we do is just being able to translate and and speak to somebody in their native tongue. Yes, yes. In last interview, one of the things that uh, Kai and Melissa talked about as being an element of the Roots of Labor Foundation is the cultivation of connection to ancestral work, to ritual work, the cultivation of meaning throughout the birth experience. Can you speak to what that has looked like for you, whether it be in the birth room or even whether it be in y'all holding space for groups within the jail? Well, just like um, outside of a jail, it's kind of meeting people where they're at too. Mm. So again, you know, some people really want to jump into their prenatal work or some people are still processing the why they're in there and the how they can get home. Sometimes I find dreams to be a real simple way to like tap into that a little bit, like to make space for their spirit, even if that's like not the word that they use. Sleep is is hard in there sometimes for some folks. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good way. Asking them about what their practices are. If You know, a lot of people are r- religious. I feel like I meet some religious folks, too. So. Um, using the appropriate terms there, asking them about their families is such an easy and accessible way to tamp it to ancestry. For people who don't maybe, you know, use that in their day-to-day, ancestry sounds like, you know, all the generations before us, which is what it is, but, like, just thinking of mom and grandpa. Like, sometimes that's a little more accessible and going deep where you, when you see where there, that there's space for that. This is such intense work on all the levels. I can imagine that burnout could be really easy. Uh, What sort of practices or systems of support do you both have to sustain yourselves? Well, um, I had to actually take a step back. There's a lot going on in my personal life. Um, Volunteering is not sustainable, unfortunately. So um, 
I was offered paid the, the days that we go to jail, paid work. And I was really burnt out. I also had some personal stuff going on. So I couldn't continue doing that work, which is very unfortunate. And I feel like a lot of times that that's a huge challenge is not not only are we not getting paid for this uh, very intense work, but we're also coming out out of pocket because the county jail for a lot of us is like a 45 minute drive. Mm. And uh, that's gas money. That's time. That's energy. Um, and if we're on call, it, it can be very difficult because we're not allowed to have our phones inside the jail. And so um, we have to leave them outside or we have to notify our our clients that we're going to be incommunicado for, you know, whatever the time is there, two hours, three hours. But uh, I feel I feel like during the time that I, I was doing this work, what really helped me was just having community. And I so appreciate that. I, I appreciate my compañeras and being part of a collective and we would try to go and have something to eat, a bite to eat after, afterward. And we'll, we would have these sort of parking lot vents, you mm-hmm. know, venting um, because, you know, you, you can't talk about anything and all the, inside the jail, obviously. So just having, um, you know, that support, um, just being able to be there for one another and listen to one another and just that love of what it is that we do and just the understanding um, was very helpful. When I had uh, one of the traumatic births that Rebecca was talking about, one of uh, our Goldula's good friend of ours showed up for me after that birth. And that was very, very important. And she just took the time and space, just m- held space for me because, um, you know, I held strong during that time that I had to be in the hospital. I couldn't, yeah. I had to maintain a presence and hold space for for the mama and the situation. But, you know, we're also human beings and we also have a lot of, you know, emotions. And so it's, 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 it's difficult. It's definitely tough. But being there for one another, just sometimes just listening to one another is a lot and just, or like a hug or, or, hey, can I bring some food? You know, sometimes we're there 12 hours, 24 hours, 30-something hours. Right. Um, sometimes there's somebody to relieve us. Sometimes there isn't. That's, it's just the way it works because we all, we all have to work to survive. And so we all have very busy schedules, and we're all trying to survive as well. And because this is volunteer work, a lot of times, you know, we may not have the capacity and the time and the energy. So sometimes just somebody being like, hey, do you need some lunch? Do you mean we stop by and give you something? Hey, do you need this? So just being able to support each other that way, yeah. being in community is very helpful. I really appreciate you framing it all like that because I think in the portrayal of birth work by mainstream spaces, there's this like romanticized notion that we're solo practitioners and we're supposed to be the placenta encapsulator, the doula, the blog writer, the fitness model, the, you know, the nutrition specialist. And a lot of times because of the hustle, especially in the Bay, um, the hustle of birth work can be challenging. And so therefore, a lot of folks I know, again, in the more, okay, I'll stop being so diplomatic. A lot of white folk, uh, they approach it in a very individualistic way where maybe they have backup doula, but even that being said, they prefer not to call upon the backup doula in the case of, you know, if you get sick or trauma or, you know, the reasons why, because they'd be missing out on money. I mean, that's like a, that's a really honest reason, although I'm sure there's other reasons too. You get attached to your clients, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that I really respect and appreciate about uh, the Roots of Labor approach to birth work is that from the beginning, y'all approach it from a collective place. Knowing that even if you are the only person to interact with your clients from beginning to end, there's never at all this this preconceived notion that you're supposed to be doing it on your own. And especially in this unpaid, highly intense, highly exhaustive situation, the notion that that there are ways to step up and step back. There's ways for your compañeras to step up, whether it be a phone call, a text, or an offer of like food or in-person show up. And then similarly, I really want to honor the way that you continue 
I mean, from my from my seat, you're still doing this work. You're, you know, maybe you're not going into that physical space now, but you're showing up today. You're continuing to show up for this organization. And I can only imagine how epically you're continuing to show up for your compañeras who are still going into the birth room. So just honoring that part of this work is knowing when to step up and when to step back and knowing that even in all those movements, we're still here. And that's the important piece. Thank you for framing it that way from the outside perspective, because I was just nodding the whole time you were saying all of that. And for like, again, to honor Ishelle right now in this moment, you're an original East Bay Birth Community Support Project. And all the Roots of Labor folks who've been there these last couple of years, we think of Ishelle as being a community service within one person Mm because she's that kind of person that will just like show up for people. And so for her to be able to take that step back for herself, like you were really modeling self-care too. And it's heavy, heavy work. And I'm glad that you we vent in the parking lot afterwards. We'll share a meal. We do show up for each other that way too. That said too, yes, we have one another to hold one another. And I'm even thinking of another member who upon, you know, to even get clearance for us to go in and at the individual level, we have to do... Um, like an eight hour Santa Rita jail orientation on on the jail premise. And we had a member who went through, was super triggered. And upon a few months of reflection, like any time before I can jump in, was saying, you know what, I just realized that that's not a good space for me. And my birth work, like you were saying, whether it's in the jail or outside or behind the mic, decided that that's not where it was for them. And we like every time we were constantly telling one another to take care of ourselves. And then when we do that for ourselves, we're also modeling that for each other, too. And Rebecca, do you have practices or systems in place to keep it going? I mean, I try to block out the rest of my day if I can. If I can't afford to take the day off, I will. I bring in my quartz or a little piece of obsidian because it's not a weapon and it won't set off a metal detector. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm on my moon, I'll wear my faja around me and mm. um, definitely like shake it off or shower. And also similarly to Ishelle, there's a lot. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're manifesting or feministing, however you want to see it funds coming to support our work that said these very beginning stages the roots this foundation we're trying to build is um this fortunamente (laughs) unfortunately uh, a lot of it's volunteer and so for example self-care for me in august was like i can't afford to go this month and that was hard for me that might from the outside that might not sound alike but for my client who's i supported in the spring to have to tell them i'm not going to see you for two months that was like, I feel it now. That's hard. So it ebbs and flows. We're a collective of that SRJ branch is probably about eight to ten people and hopefully more soon so that we can make space for when people need to step up and step back. Right. Right. So speaking again and again about the fact that this is unpaid work, it's arguably one of the most important things to be done right now. And it's unpaid So for those of us who are hearing this story and hearing more about this work, how can we best support you? Well, first, I just kind of want to like donate. (laughs) (laughs) Donate your money, please. (laughs) Yes, donations. But first, I want to even speak to the fact why it's been unpaid for so long. So Mm, it's like we were mentioning before Birth Justice Project, um, who also co-founders of that OG East Bay Community Birth Support Project from 2014, from which Roots of Labor came from, they passed this on to us in 2016 because they had been doing it for two years, volunteer, and we're at capacity where people were moving on, going to nursing or midwifery programs, moving out of state, and passed that torch and also the security clearance because that was not easy for them to get through. This is free and volunteer work because not only are people incarcerated invisible, to us and do we forget them but we always forget that there's women incarcerated or that there's even expecting people that are incarcerated right now too so I don't think it's coincidence that this has been volunteer work for so long because no one's giving money for us to take care of our forgotten people right and community members but things that would be helpful the donation um, at rootsoflabor.com on our donation page. There's a PayPal button. 
if you yourself are needing birth support, come support one of our doulas. Supporting our doulas also brings some green. We do live in a capitalistic society uh, our way so that we can keep supporting you and supporting our community members and then even littler things who out there wants to give us printing privileges we want to have resources to share with our folks inside donate their birth books or their doula books it's been really beautiful to support people and show up for people and then them have them say i want to be a doula Mm -hmm. and how cool is it that we can plant that seed of them supporting their communities and that there's an existing collective outside with a holistic, comprehensive training on the other side and collective to, like, hold that and feed that dream. Um, I mean, yes, and gas money would be dope, too. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Ishel, is there anything else that you Um, want to add to yeah, well, we were we were talking about breastfeeding support. Uh, San Francisco Jail has a breastfeeding support implemented already at the jail, and it would be nice to have that at SRJ if anybody wants to take that on. Meaning, um, like a lactation consultant comes in, or or they provide breast pump machines, or what is that? I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I think somehow they pump the breast milk, um, and then it's they have some sort of mechanism so that they can give it. To the baby. Oh, so maybe to provide opportunity to freeze the and breast transport. milk and transport. Oh. We still got to figure out the details, but we know San Francisco Jail yeah. is doing it, and we're calling out Santa Rita, essentially. Cause yeah. Because they, in a weird way, feel really prideful uh, that they're one of the biggest and quote-unquote best jails in the country and um, well get some breastfeeding in there <laughs> and if you're so good right also any lawyers social workers yeah. people that work with cps yeah. immigration more volunteers volunteering your time and your energy um can that- i can i pause and ask you to state that again so legal services legal services uh for child support for or uh child family custody lawyers. family lawyers custody um people in jail immigration, immigration. law okay. uh, lawyers um CPS, social workers, all that. Housing services. Housing services. uh, That's a a question that comes up a lot. The housing resources. So I want to say her name. Um, Jessica St. Louis um, was found dead on July 28th at the Dublin Pleasanton BART station after being released from Santa Rita Jail at 1.30 a.m. Just to give people an idea who don't know, uh, the walk from... Santa Rita Jail, first of all, at that time, there's no bus transportation. There's no BART running. We all know that. She was given a BART pass. And the walk from there, I think, is a little over a mile. Uh, there's no sidewalks um, coming out of the jail to to walk on. You're basically on the road. I think the lighting's pretty bad. Um, so just to give people an idea what that looks like. So one of the justifications for releasing her at that time was that they are required by law to release people by their terms. But we know that um, that hasn't been the case for people, especially for uh, migrant folks who are undocumented. They've stayed there. They've stayed for like almost a week past their release date because they want ICE to pick them up and for them to go to the detention center In- and then be deported. Yeah, in preparation for this, um, when I was doing research, there's a lot of stuff that came up about the parallels between how um, immigrant folk are treated in jail systems and how they're treated in, in in internment camps. And similarly, while there may be legislature that's written, the follow through deviates greatly depending on the location and who's working at the time. So I can only imagine how that plays out. In our local jails. And again, what I appreciate about how y'all work is that you're not approaching this by saying, oh, and we're going to stay in our lane and just talk about birth room. Like the fact that you all are approaching this in such a holistic way that as part of my question to you of how best to support you, your answer is so multifaceted and your answer is very much how best to support the people that you serve. And I think that right there is what distinguishes this organization from so many across the country, let alone the Bay, and why I am so honored to have you here. Yeah, 
Yes, thank you for having us. Like you said, it is multifaceted and showing up to help each other. I mean, scopes are our scope as doulas is very limited. So we need lawyers, we need the social workers, we need amazing podcasts to <laughs> to amplify our voices as we try to like make visible these people who are not seen yeah. and are very much there. So those are our neighbors and community members. I just want to say that I think it's it's very important to uphold everybody's humanity. And so I think that's something I'm very proud of about being a part of this collective that we we really I mean talk about inclusivity, right? We just really take that into like we really work for that. Like we really upholding people's humanity no matter what. I think everybody deserves especially in such a sacred time as birth. Everybody deserves support and love in that sacred time. So. Mm. Yes, thank you, Shell. And I mean, you kind of called out a little bit the white doula earlier, and I think in that I'll throw the the sole practitioner, the full spectrum doula, real full spectrum doula ing is inclusive of this. Is inclusive of our people who who aren't seen and are not free. So I'm not trying to shame you. I'm just telling you to step up. (laughs) Yes. And for folks who are intrigued by that invitation, the next episode, we will dive even deeper into what that actually means to say that you are a full spectrum doula. That being said, I'm kind of sad to even be saying this last question, but because I just so appreciate this conversation and you being here. In closing... Do you have any advice, wisdom, or guidance to offer those who might be listening? We're pausing because we're trying to channel in the ancestors right now. Yeah, yeah, no, all good. (laughs) Hear what they want us to say. Take your time. Mm. Sorry, I just keep thinking about the story that I wanted to share and that I can't share. The stories. I'm a storyteller, so I'm really... This has been very frustrating for me because I can't share those stories. And I think stories are very powerful. Yeah. And so it's like my ancestors are so yelling at me, like, tell their stories, say their name, but I can't. So I'm just sorry. So I, I'm usually not this quiet. <laughs> 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 FYI, if you get to know me, I'm like very like, I'm, I'm really yeah, surprised. Invite each other to dinner or lunch <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk about <laughs> SRJ and some reproductive justice. Um, I mean, advice for, I mean, folks who are re-entry, we see you and um, come to us even if you're not expecting or have family. Um, we have doula circles, we do events, and just a lot of love for the re-entry community. If you're interested in doing this work yourself, come and we'll hold you. Doulas that are interested, come to a doula circle. Roots of Labor holds a doula circle. They're open to the community. Folks curious about birth work every third Tuesday of the month, just email us. You can find that on the website. Wisdom and guidance. Ooh. I- <laughs> no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. I mean, just that I can't. Michelle just said it so well earlier about humanizing this and we are only as strong as a society as our most disenfranchised and without liberties peoples yeah. in that. And um, don't forget them. And I know that this is also uncomfortable. Also, don't don't Madonna complex us or savior us because, um, yeah, we also don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's another another thing we talk about a lot, too, is how uncomfortable sometimes it is for t- for us to talk about this work, because usually the responses we get are, oh, that's so great. Duels are in there or, um, wow, you're so wonderful. It's like, no, we're not trying to do that to ourselves. But people need to know that there are enough pregnant people that are incarcerated for us to have been going every single Monday for the last two years and even two years before that with Birth Justice Project. So. We're doing this work and we're also constantly having to do the work of sitting in discomfort. Every time we walk out of the jail and are re-given our civil liberties with our government identification ID, it's Mm -hmm. a real check of our privileges as free people. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say just 
let's not lose our humanity. That's very important. And um, that when we judge other people or when we um, sort of dehumanize other people, we're, we're losing our own humanity. So to uphold that for others is also upholding that for ourselves. And I think that's important that we keep that in mind in the way that we walk this life that we want to walk. And just rem remind ourselves, like, what are we here? Like, just like the general picture, like, what are we here for? You know, I, I like to say that I'm, I'm here to love and to be loved. And um, that's very powerful. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, money and the material things and everything is um, is not going to go with us when we transition to the spirit world. So what are we here? What are we living for? What are we fighting for to love and be loved and uphold our humanity and, and other people's humanity and ourselves? Thank you. Matios Tlazokamati. Tlazokamati is a Nahuatl word for thank you, but it's more than that. It's a, I see the fire within you. I see the fire of love within you. And Matios is a, it's a Kachikel word from the some tribal folks in Guatemala that means thank you. Roots of Labor Birth Collective is a doula of color-led grassroots organization serving the Bay Area. We offer full-spectrum doula support to families of all identities, and we cannot provide these services without you and your community support. To donate and learn more about our work, visit our website, rootsoflaborbc.com. The music you heard on today's show is entitled, This Is Not Our Home performed by the Lady Lifers. Deep gratitude to Ishel Chavez and Rebecca Orozco from the Roots of Labor Birth Collective for being our guests. Follow me on Instagram at Birth Bruja to continue the conversation. I've been your host, Ari Guajardo Johnson. The Birth Bruja podcast is produced by Catherine Petru of We Rise. Be sure to check out show notes for links and resources. Follow us on SoundCloud and iTunes to help us expand the impact of this work. Until next time, my friends, thank you for all the ways you show up in this world. Blessings and gratitude. <laughs>